Good morning. I'm uh, happy to be here today, uh, if we can get my slides up, to um, share some ideas with you about communication feedback loops. And there's both, uh, I think, interest here on my part on what communication feedback loops occur in natural human settings and how technologies can be used to study those feedback loops, and also how we can create new technologies to enable feedback loops that don't exist today. And just to set a, a business context first, uh, I think we are going through really a sea change in the world of media as the two biggest worlds, two realms, television and, so and the social web come into full collision. And it is wreaking havoc in the industry and whether you're in the entertainment industry or in marketing or media of any sort, uh, in many ways the world is being disrupted. And in that I see an opportunity which is to create for the first time an in-context, real-time audience feedback loop for everything that happens in mass media. And in particular, I'll talk about what we're doing in the world of uh, television. But there's a very unusual backstory to this, which also involves feedback loops, which is research that I conduct at MIT. So pictured here is my son and me photographing him, a very common relationship I, I have with my son, of using what I'll tell you about today, big data, to first of all observe life, natural life, and understand in some new ways communications, feedback loops that occur, in this case between my son and myself and my wife as he learned his first words. And then I'll take you from that research at MIT to a company that I co-founded that came out of the research lab that has taken that very same concept of feedback loops and applied it to the world of, uh, of social media and television. So here's where the story begins. This is my uh, previous house. Uh, we've moved since uh, in, in the Boston area. And um, I wonder if we can dim the lights a little bit so that we can see the, uh, the visuals better. Uh, I'll be showing some sort of relatively low co contrast images in a bit. Uh, in our house, if you came into our living room and you looked up, you'd see a very unusual thing in the ceiling, uh, a camera and a microphone mounted in the living room. And if you look down from that camera, you get a bird's eye view into our living room. So this is actually my son uh, there with a the big ball, and there I am on the couch sipping coffee. And as we interact, we get home video from this unusual perspective. And so this is a little, a little clip of video from one camera. Here's the view from nine of 11 cameras that were in the home. And what we did is created an unusual kind of home video recorder, which could capture natural life rather than someone having to get behind the camera and capture what was happening. Instead, we're, we're flying through a, a day uh, of life in my home, and over the course of uh, the better part of three years, we captured about a quarter million hours of multi-stream audio and video. So you're looking here at part of a disk array which holds the world's largest home video collection. And the reason for doing this was a, a scientific goal, which is given this kind of a data set, roughly 10 hours a day throughout a home, and solving for various privacy issues for how we maintain control over the recordings, which are kept in a secure site, and how we uh, train researchers so that uh, people have access to the content for only the purposes that were uh, behind the project and so forth. Could we unlock from this kind of fir uh, first of its kind longitudinal data set new insights into how my son learned his first words? And so I'm going to summarize for you a few of those results and give you a sense in the process of how we developed visualization techniques, data mining uh, algorithms, and so forth to pull out of raw data patterns. So the first thing I'll do is take you through a uh, sort of acoustic equivalent of a time-lapse video. You've all seen, I'm sure, 
time-lapse videos of a flower blossoming where you skip forward every frame a day. What we're going to do is listen to the blossoming of a word form. So my son, when he was about uh, 12 months old, started saying gaga to mean water. And then over the course of about half of a year, sort of two steps forward, one step back, he started to learn how to uh, approximate the English form of the word water. So we're going to go linearly through time, and the reason we're able to do this is two things. We have this continuous recording of sort of life in the wild in our home, and we developed uh, machine-assisted technologies to find and rapidly annotate speech, even in these sort of early word forms. So we have an index into the data so the data plus an index lets us then go and, in this case, listen to a trajectory. So we're going to go from, uh, from Gaga to water in about 40 seconds, flying through about six, six months of development. So there is a trace of a kind that hasn't been heard before because although of great interest is sort of the dynamics, development dynamics, uh, it's very hard to trace back and find sort of the early forms of one word, let alone all words. But what we proceeded to do is create a chart of what we called word births. And this is month by month words as they first appeared in my son's vocabulary. And over the course of the first two years, he learned, uh, and this is, uh, he was an early uh, talker, well over 500 words entered his vocabulary. And so for every word we knew to what month, and in fact, pretty much down to the moment where he first used each word. So we had this map of the development that actually occurred. And then our interest became to go and look at the social context around my son, in order to see if we could predict and in some, to some degree explain why did he learn the words in the order he did. How did the environment influence uh, the whole language development process? And just to summarize one of the key results that we published about two years ago in, in this graph, we have two axes. One is the change in caregiver utterance length. How long was the typical sentence that my son heard from my, myself, my wife, our nanny. And on the, the other axis is a relative time dimension, which is the zero point marks for any given word when it was born, when it first appeared in his vocabulary. And what this curve indicates is, in my opinion, a remarkable trajectory of the caregiver speech constantly restructuring itself, getting simpler and simpler, and meeting my son exactly at the moment of birth, and then slowly lifting him into communication. And the only way to explain this phenomena, that the adults are adjusting their speech continuously in a predictive way, so that as he's preparing to or about to use the word for the first time, there's sort of a, a minimum in the structure of language. And, and this kind of fine tuning uh, behavior, this adaptive lock-in of the caregiver speech and child speech uh, has not been detected before because the data didn't exist. So this is just to give you an example. I've summarized uh, you know, two PhDs and, a, and several years of work in this graph, but this is an example of the kind of uh, 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 coupling that we're starting to see. So let me take you now into the visual dimension. That was an example of caregiver speech interacting with my son's speech. This is a reconstruction of our home. So every one of those fisheye lens views into a room we have straightened. So we've done some uh, 
projective transforms in order to get the linear view into the house or with the roof cut off. And we can actually do a pretty interesting thing. We can reconstruct the full three-dimensional uh, look and feel of being in this home. And we did this for a reason. We're getting a little tour of my home through the, through the kitchen and into the dining room and finally the living room. And we did this because after a couple of years of trying to deal with these raw data sets of video taken from different rooms, we found that connecting it all back into a, a whole and create an interactive way to visualize and move through the data uh, made it a lot easier to start uh, layering structures on top. So what we're seeing here is in faint green, and again, if we bring the lights down, we could see this better. Um, I am leaving a green path, and my son, as we're fast forwarding through half an hour of footage is going through, uh, is leaving a red path. And we're, we're looking at paths left behind in time over a 30 minute period. If we let time now be the vertical dimension, what we can actually reveal are these three dimensional structures where these knots of two colors are what we call social hotspots. My son and I interacting together when we were on the couch looking at a car. This spiraling pattern is very different. This is not a social hotspot. There's only one color. It's just my son playing a little walking toy by himself. So by having this three-dimensional visualization environment, we're able to start seeing interaction structures, which of course we're living every day, but we, we're not used to thinking of capturing and being able to then turn into a new kind of data type to understand. So, this was setting the stage for the next level of analysis, and we come back to this question of can we predict, can we explain why my son learned certain words before others. So here's what we did. So we're looking into the living room, and in a minute, you're going to see my son, there is a little tiny guy here, he's gonna start walking around the coffee table, and our nanny is going to offer him some water. And as she says the word water, of course he hears that, then they're going to walk off to the kitchen to get water. And what I was interested in doing is taking every single time that my son heard the wa word water and intersect it with the activity patterns that were happening as he heard the word water. And the hypothesis was, on average, if he heard certain words in recurrent, repeated uh, situations, he, was more, he would be more likely to learn that word earlier. That's the structure of everyday life, where there's patterns, where there's some kind of consistency that can serve as scaffolding for him to learn words more effectively. So how do you actually test that hypothesis with data? So let's watch this video unfold. We're tracing his pattern of movement. You want water? She says water. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and we tag this piece of activity as they move off into the kitchen. And now we take two years of data and we intersect every single time the word water was used with the video patterns of what was happening while the word was heard. And as we pass through and we fast forward through two years of life in our home, what's left in the wake of this intersection is a kind of landscape, okay? We call this a wordscape. And uh, in this case, a fairly obvious thing happens. You see a lot of the activity is happening in the kitchen, of course. That's where water is served. But then you see this really interesting peak way off in the distance. That is a rocking chair where we used to read to our son before he'd go to bed. And often uh, there would be water involved in that activity and then sometimes over in the couch. So there's this landscape for the word water. And in fact, every word has a landscape. So let's go over to the entrance of the house. And if we now look at the word bye, as in goodbye, this is where a lot of goodbyes and, and greetings and, and uh, departures would happen. It's the entryway into the house. And if we look at the transformation of the landscape for the word bye, we see a significant structure uh, show up over there. So in this way, we could take every single word that ever was heard in our household 
and for it build its own individual wordscape. So now the question is, is that predictive? So here's a second result, second to last result I'd like to share today. This first graph shows a baseline. What's well known, and I think will match your intuitions, the more often a child hears a word, the more likely they are to, hear, uh, to learn the word. So if you hear a word frequently, one would predict it's going to be learned earlier. And that's exactly what we find, but it's a relatively weak correlation, R of 0.23. So this is the actual date of uh, word birth. Each dot here is one word that he learned. And the vertical axis is based on just how often that word occurred in the caregiver speech, uh, the prediction we can draw. And we get a, a weak but definite um, prediction. When we take the wordscapes, the visual context of when those words were heard into account, we see a pronounced increase in the correlation. In other words, by taking into account the structure and how repeatable the structure is during the occurrence of every word, we get a much stronger prediction. So we're actually predicting word by word what order my son will learn his words based on these two pieces of data put together. Again, the message here, or sort of the, the guiding um, intuition, is that the context, the shared common ground that my son and uh, the caregivers in, in the home share is shaping and governing this development process. So let me summarize uh, that research, which is ongoing, with the following picture, which is, although we tend to think about, in, certainly in the scientific community, about language development as something that a child does, a child's language develops, in fact, what's clearly happening is the caregiver's language and action is also developing. They're happening in a feedback loop. Okay. And the way that that dip in language structure meets my son's point of departure for a new word so perfectly over and over across all of the words in his vocabulary is that surely we're tracking in very nuanced ways what my son does, not, does and does not understand, and we are shifting our communication accordingly and shifting our activity patterns accordingly uh, presumably to create the perfect environment or an optimal environment for learning. And I think we do this subconsciously. We're not thinking through every move. It just happens. So let me take you now from the world of child communication, sort of an unexpected set of turns. One of my PhD students, Michael Fleischman, was working with me on this research. And during the course of his research, shifted gears and said, this same idea seems to be relevant not just for child language acquisition, but it's somehow more fundamental to how people communicate. And we ended up starting this company, uh, which is, so it's a startup based in uh, Boston, just a uh, short walk away from MIT. And let me give you the sort of the principles that drive from this work and, and where it took us. So what works for caregiver and child is also true for speakers and listeners in general. In fact, we just heard Simon talk about the importance of being uh, together in a room. And I think the foundation that he was also talking about is that there's a communication loop going on that is broken if you listen to him recorded on a, on a piece of video. And that starts with one-to-one -one communication. Most effective way to talk to someone is to watch them and listen to them as you talk to them. And where you see they are interested, give them more. Where you see they don't care or they're not understanding, pull back. And so continuously adapt. And that requires live two-way uh, connections. It's true one-to-one. -one. It's also true one-to-many. Whether you're an entertainer on stage, a live performance is never done exactly the same, twi same way twice. If you're a politician, and you're on your soapbox talking to your live audience, or a marketer selling. Live is the best way to do it. So here's what, what happened recently. Well, not recently, over the last 60, 70 years. A layer of technology has come in to play. And so for all of you who are in, for example, consumer-facing companies, your marketing divisions are, of course, using mass media to reach your consumer and your potential consumers. Uh, 
And mass media has a plus, a good, thing, a good side to it, and a bad side to it. The good side is it multiplies audience. So radio first, television, print, but really what's come to dominate the mindset in marketing, television, multiplies audience, but it comes at a cost. It cuts off that feedback loop. And in the process, the whole mindset of how companies communicate with the marketplace has become one way. So rather than talking with your audience, you're talking at them. And this is not a good place to be if you're in the audience, because now you have sound bites, now you have spam, as opposed to being in this kind of effective communication loop. So that's what I believe has come uh, to, to be the mindset in mass media communication because of a, a technological limitation. And then something happened, and this is some data uh, that we pulled just from, from our, uh, our platform, which I'll tell you more about in a minute. These are comments, raw comments in the wild. In blue, people talking about commercials. In black, people talking about shows on US television. And the volume and velocity of, of this new uh, data stream is on the ascent. There's so more and more people who are using social media, Twitter, Facebook, the blogosphere, to talk about what they're watching as they watch it. And one way to summarize what this new data stream represents is a new feedback loop. And it's come into place because of a new layer of technology. And this feedback loop is giving the audience a voice. They're talking about what they're watching. They've always talked about what they're watching. Now they're talking about it publicly. And interestingly, the voices behind the mass media side are not even in the conversation. They're out of the loop. So this is a very volatile and very dangerous time, in fact, for anyone whose livelihood or whose business practices depend on mass media. Because more important than the occasional tweet that goes viral and that's read by millions of people are the millions of little conversations that are percolating now in public view that together are shaping public perception of mass media messages. So power has shifted to the audience, no doubt. But ultimately, if the companies and the governments behind mass media are not able to effectively communicate and read audience interests, read audience uh, desires, um, they can't serve their audience. So there's something broken, but in this we also see an opportunity, which is to eradicate this barrier in a way that's never been possible before. And, do, and, and what we're doing is actually studying and at scale mapping out the cause-effect patterns of how particular content on mass media is driving conversation and using that in a way to, feed, to create a new feedback communication cycle. So let's, take, let's go through that. So this is uh, to introduce this, this uh, startup, which is uh, really kind of a, a research uh, lab that has, is starting to now apply these ideas uh, at scale. So here's the basic concept. If you have a piece of content on television, it's going to make a set of impressions on an audience. And in fact, the entire uh, mass media industry is priced based on this uh, uh, count of impressions. How many people did I reach? How many eyeballs? What's the demographic? How many men? How many women? How old? Uh, that's what sets the currency for the entire industry, which, by the way, is uh, in the United States alone, $70 billion spent on TV ads. This is a remarkable number. But people aren't just sitting there taking imp impressions. They're expressing themselves. They've always talked about the messages, but now these expressions have their own audience networks. So expressions are radiating through the social network. So I'm just restating this, this basic idea, which is impressions translate into expressions. And marketers, for example, are paying attention. So this is a recent uh, quote from Joe Tripodi, CMO of Coca-Cola, arguably the most valuable brand in the world. And he's reflecting on the 125th anniversary of the Coca-Cola brand. And he ends this piece, this was in, uh, in HBR, in Harvard Business Review last month, saying, while he's curious how many impressions their marketing activities will generate 
uh, in the, in the uh, future. What he's much more closely looking at are the expressions of his consumers as a better measure of success. So there is a shift happening in Coca-Cola where rather than trying to reach more and more people effectively, what they're actually starting to monitor is how people out there are of, on their own expressing themselves about his brand. And so there is, again, this shift in power um, to the audience that here the CMO of Coke is focused on. So here's what we're doing at Bluefin. This is a snapshot now. Rather than understanding the dynamics and the communication patterns of my family, uh, we've turned the same methods of connecting language to shared context onto the publicly available internet and the publicly available world of broadcast media. So on one side we have here, a snapshot of 50,000 people out of our database of about 15 million that today we are uh, analyzing. And for every person in our database, we use publicly available sources to build an entire uh, social graph of how, how everyone is connected. And then second, and again, if we can bring the lights down, it'd be great, we have the content graph here of television. Every node in this visualization represents a piece of television content, a show, a commercial that we are ingesting. So we actually have satellite dishes that are 24-7 now watching virtually all television in the United States. So we're, we're pulling in right now 50, the 50 biggest networks in, in US uh, uh, television landscape. And for every network, every show that airs, every commercial that airs, we're tracking and keeping set of a set of relationships of what is occurring next to what when two commercials share the same uh, brand or the same sector, when two shows are of the same um, uh, series, all of those relationships we're tracking and creating a gigantic graph of how the content is related to each other. And then, so we have the social graph up there, we've got the content graph down below, and then the key piece is this connective tissue that weaves this very rich pattern between the social web and television. And what every line here represents, if you trace any one of those lines coming down from a node in the social graph, what we're doing is inferring every time someone talks about something on TV. And it turns out, just as one data point, in the US last month, we picked up with high precision 13 million comments. Okay, so there's far more people watching TV, but that's a pretty interesting number, 13 million, and we are tracking its ascent. So it's uh, going up a significant percentage month over month as more and more people sort of adopt this practice. And so this is sort of visual evidence of a very rich kind of feedback loop which is in play. We, call, we have a, a sort of a fun name for this. We call this the genome of television. And the concept is if you literally watch everything on TV and you listen to everything being said about TV and you link the two, you have the data set, the basis for understanding in new ways the engagement properties and sort of the communication properties of this medium. So that's uh, sort of a picture of a slice of the TV genome. And so what we're doing is working towards more and more total coverage of this data set and driving the quality of the data up. Today we can generate a new data point uh, for the TV genome in about 24 hours. By the end of the year, we'll bring that down to roughly five minutes. So a latency of five minutes after someone comments on something, it'll be discovered, linked, and integrated into sort of the, the, the overall data set uh, very fast. So uh, this is just to give you a scale of what is happening literally today uh, in, our, in our system, 47 networks where the video is being video fingerprinted, two million minutes uh, per month of video being analyzed down to a pixel level. Uh, we have over 100,000 TV shows, all US content right now that's been indexed uh, uh, against audience reactions. And the, the input funnel on the social media side, roughly three billion comments a month being processed 
uh, out of which a very small sort of uh, uh, piece of that data is actually extracted and creates these link structures. So what we're doing, just to summarize, is this kind of cause-effect analysis between, in this case, TV and this, the live social media and using that to create this data set. And the three things that Bluefin is now doing built on top of this data set is, first of all, creating, and we're about to announce uh, a pair of metrics, which I'll give you a preview of today, just to give you a sense of how we're doing this, to measure the social media impact that television is having. So literally just have a benchmark set of metrics. Uh, so rather than counting how many people watch something, can we count to what degree the content is moving people to social action? And when you have a comprehensive view of what's happening, uh, in, in, uh, in a media market, you can actually get benchmark numbers. We're using that, as you might expect, to optimize uh, sort of the advertising lifecycle for more effective communication, and we're creating new social TV services. So I'm not going to belabor this too much, uh, but just to give you a sense, some shows, popular shows on U.S. television, we can measure a overall kind of like a Richter scale, a response level of how much uh, a piece of content move people to talk, uh, and we can also do a relative comparison of how any particular show created conversation, what was its share of response uh, across all conversations taking place at that point across the United States. And so we can get both this absolute and relative scale, and we can slice and dice American Idol, how did it do compared to other shows in its genre, so we can sort of slice the genome along a genre dimension or a day part dimension. Um, and beneath each of these numbers, The Voice is a popular new reality show on, on US television. For each number, there's actually a collection of conversations. I mean, this is a, a remarkable fact that for every piece of media, essentially th the world is serving as a focus group in the wild. And if you harvest that data and link it back to its source, you can get insights into how millions of people, in this case the voice, you know, why is it they're talking about the show? There are certain actors that they're most uh, interested in. They're making comparisons to American Idol. So in the running commentary of the show, fr from a media perspective, there's gold here in understanding how shows relate to one another, what is driving the conversation. What, occur, what you can do with shows, you can also do with networks. So we're taking now all the major networks in US television and comparing them in terms of which are driving the most conversation, um, doing this over time, and so forth. Last thing, which is rather uh, curious, uh, this is just an, a sample analysis of a commercial. Geico is a big insurance company in the United States. They have a habit of making ads like this one of a squealing pig in a back seat of a car, which uh, drives a lot of sort of bipolar reactions from, from the audience. Um, here, here's the amazing thing. This same, it's a 30 second piece of media, the identical piece of media, when it plays in a late night talk show versus an NFL, American football show uh, game, you have four times more conversations sparked on average by the same piece of media during a football game versus a late night show. But when you normalize that response count by how many people were watching, so impressions versus expressions, you find that there's a threefold higher likelihood that someone's going to talk about this commercial when it occurs in one viewing context versus the other. So what we're able to do with this data is start measuring context effects on media. Same message, different context. How much word of mouth does it spark? Measurable differences, threefold difference. If you want to start conversations with that commercial, that's where you should put your money. Right? So this is uh, actionable data. Last example of what we're doing. Uh, this is, again, with the National Football League. Uh, hard to see here, but there is what we call a social heat map. This is an online video uh, DVR application that the, the National Football League launched last season that's powered by Bluefin. Uh, 
And up there is the conventional, we heard about TiVo, sort of the conventional TiVo-like DVR uh, capability to watch a piece of video. Down here is the social graph woven into the TV experience. So you can go and for any play in this football game, there's a bar, the height of the bar indicates how many people talked about that play. If you touch a play, it will take you to exactly that moment in the game. And as you watch it, you can see the conversation that was linked to that play. Down here, kind of an interesting widget, hottest plays of the game by week and by season, crowdsourced, no editorial input involved. Purely based on what the audience was talking about, we auto-generate highlight reels. So just the sort of power of listening to the audience, feeding it back into the audience experience, um, this is really just the, the tip of the iceberg. So just to conclude, back to uh, our, uh, our television genome, there's a lot more um, that is coded in this data than, than I've been able to share with you. I'll, I'll end with three examples. The first is just doing an analysis of watching what we call a sort of a social circuit at play. If we trace the time dy dynamics here, here is a piece of content and it leads one person to make a comment in the public social web. And as we trace that person's set of connections and we query back to see who else in this person's network talked about that same piece of content as it aired, we see a, a very tightly linked set of connections. What we're looking at is essentially a virtual living room, a set of people who were not located in one room, but who were all connected to each other and talking about the same piece of content. Shared common ground in television, dynamics of conversation and television tune-in um, sort of on display. A second example is a very special person I'm sure you've heard much about finding influencers in social graphs. People get followed a lot. Here's someone who gets followed a lot and also talks a lot about TV. A kind of pro-am, professional amateur media critic. So this is a social TV connector. Very interesting person to understand what influences this person, what it is that catches their eye, why they spend so much time critiquing television. Last example is a piece of, rather than a person that's interesting, a piece of content that's interesting, of course, tied to a person. Here's President Obama giving his State of the Union address from earlier this year. And this is all real data, by the way. So if we trace that one piece of media and all the conversations it drove in the same network, we see literally a nation, in this case, bursting into conversation. And we can x-ray its contents and essentially get a social echo of a nation as they respond to President Obama's address. And imagine now this capability available in real time uh, for elections, uh, which is one of the places where Bluefin is now going. And so with that, I will end. Thank you very much. I'm told I have three minutes, so if there's a, a question or two, I'm happy to take them. Or we can have three more minutes for coffee, I guess. Yeah. Ah, we have a question. Um. About the, the beginning of your presentation, uh, being your own object of study, didn't this introduce a bias in your study? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's um, no doubt it introduced a bias. And everything is a, a question of uh, uh, sort of uh, relative gains. So compared to what's the tradition in studying child development is to either bring a child and caregiver, or sometimes just a child, into a lab setting and make observational studies in a sort of clinical setting, which has huge, creates huge biases, or to send sort of uh, anthropo uh, uh, apology teams into living rooms, into homes to make sort of uh, occasional studies, both of which 
uh, completely disrupt sort of the natural social operating system. So in comparison, what we did is far more natural. Uh, in the end, we're of course aware that we're making these recordings that will be used for research purposes, so it has some effect. But I think in, in relative terms, uh, far, far, far less than the alternatives. So it's all about sort of, sort of pu pushing ahead on the methodology, but um, uh, the observational biases are always there. I think there's no way to ethically, no way to have observation, bias-free observation. Thank you. I was very impressed by, uh, by the presentation and the links you're, uh, you're making. Any thoughts on data privacy and what, what brings, what comes to mind is, uh, yes, the, the ability to control people in mm -hmm. real time and, and here in Europe maybe we're also maybe more, uh, yeah. uh, yes, more attached to these types of uh, data privacy issues. Sure. So our, um, I mean, and there's, there's privacy issues which come up, uh, as, you, uh, as I'm sure you see, in, in both pieces of work. Uh, it sounds like you're talking more about the second piece. Um, our approach has been to take all sources of public media where the individual intent is to broadcast their thoughts. So that means uh, Twitter, uh, which you know, is uh, continuing to grow in usage, is very much thought of as your, your personal broadcasting station. That's where you broadcast publicly. Most people who have followers don't know much, most of their followers, so there's a, a very public, it's, it's where you wear your public thoughts on your sleeve. And similarly in Facebook, most of Facebook we don't analyze. It's a very thin stream where people decide to make their posts public. It's essentially sort of microblogging platform. So any public, uh, expressions where people are putting out there for anyone who wants to read, those we aggregate tied to television. And then the other thing we do is we focus on aggregate views. So we're not really interested in, in general, every one of the 15 million people and going back to them. Uh, if there's someone who wears a, a very, has a very public persona, they're constantly talking on Twitter, they're constantly blogging, and there's you know, thousands of people following that person, that person's already in a relatively public light. If it's sort of the person who is much more in, in a uh, personal setting, but just sharing fleeting thoughts as they go by, those conversations we want to aggregate and see is there any kind of systematic pattern. So in terms of privacy, you know, that's the message. In terms of control, I, I think what's happening here, beyond what we're doing, is there's very rich data sets that are being unleashed around us. And whoever organizes and, and understands what's in those data sets, um, it, it's almost definitional. There's power there. It's, it, this is powerful stuff. Uh, there's many examples of powerful technologies, and there's always a set of questions around the ethics of who has them and what's done with them, and there's, there's no difference here. So we're, we're mindful of this, uh, but I, I do believe, you know, that the idea that an organization that has the power to use mass media um, is not by sort of definition good or bad, right? And governments, um, big companies, which many of you work for, are not necessarily good or bad. It goes back to uh, you know, our first talk, why, it, why does it exist? If you agree with what that organization's there to do, and then you see it is failing to use mass media, it's failing to actually communicate and read its audience, um, that's a bad thing if you believe in what the organization's trying to do. And so then this kind of technology is presumably good. So I see the uh, time card up, so I'll probably, I could go on and on this point, but thank you very much. <laughs>